Good evening and welcome to TL Physics and today I'm going to cover about SHM with a pendulum system. So there are two types of systems that you need to know about, a spring and a pendulum, and today I'm going to focus on the pendulum. So a pendulum system is one like this. So a pendulum system is a string that oscillates like this. Now I'm going to show you where a certain formula comes from. It's not in the actual syllabus itself, but it actually highlights some really important things. Uh, this, so the derivation is in the syllabus, but it highlights some really important things that you need to be aware of in the syllabus. So the formula I'm going to derive for you today is the fact that the time period of the oscillation of the pendulum is 2 pi, so time period big T, square root of the length over G, which is 9.81. I'm going to just talk you through what's happening here. I've got my weight down and I have a tension here. And for sake of ease, I'm going to change the letter for the tension because I don't want to get mixed up between them. So I'm going to change the letter for tension and I'm just going to change it to, mm, let's change it to R for a reaction, okay? Because tension is a reaction force. This here is the length of my uh, string. Now, it's really important to know that the reason we can say that this follows S SHM, simple harmonic motion, is that the acceleration towards the equilibrium point is directly proportional to the negative of the displacement. That's actually really important to understand what I mean by displacement, because for a pendulum, it's actually quite awkward. The displacement of a pendulum is the distance between here and the equilibrium point, the point where my string is hanging like this. And so that there, when it's maximally stretched out, is my amplitude. So this here is the amplitude. And what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to try and relate all of this together. I'm going to find about this time period of this oscillation here. Now, there's something very special about this, which you need to be aware of from its derivation. I'm going to assume that the force that is causing this oscillation is a centripetal force. And as you can see, it does look like part of a circle. That the force that is causing it to oscillate is this centripetal force here, this tension here. And what I'm going to do... <coughs> is I'm going to find what that value is of that force there. I'm going to do this by taking components. So that's Ty, and that is Tx. Okay, so Ty equals mg, because it's an equilibrium, and cos theta, because that's theta there, is Ty over t. So t is ty over cos theta, which is, um, oh, so I apologise, r, sorry, habit using that there, mg over cos theta. Now this is actually quite awkward, this idea of saying, because when you're talking about circular motion, the acceleration is towards the centre of the actual circle, not in the direction of the um, actual, what I'm saying, the amplitude is. And this is where something really important comes into this, this idea of approximation. Now cos theta, Cos theta, when it's a small angle, cos theta equals approximately 1. And what I'm going to say is that up until around about 20 degrees, cos theta is approximately 1. Which means that as long as theta is small, okay, that my force inwards, this tension that's being caused, this reaction force, equals mg. 
And I'm saying that that there is the force that is causing me to oscillate. And <clears throat> if here, what's happening here, if I actually put that into a circular motion formula, I would have m omega squared r equals mg, where r is the radius of the circle, so that's going to be l. And I can just rearrange this so my m's cancel out, and I end up with m omega squared equals g over l. And then I end up with 2 pi over t squared. So that's going to be, there you go, g over l. So if I bring that up here, I'm going to have 4 pi squared over t squared equals g over l. I want t on its own. So I'm going to bring that down and that would come up. So I'd end up with l over g, 4 pi squared is t squared. I'm going to square root everything. So I'm going to square root everything. And the square root of 4 is 2. And the square root of pi squared is pi, which leaves me with the formula of t equals 2 pi root l over g. And once I know my time period, I can work out my frequency. I can work out my amplitude. I can work out my maximum acceleration. I can work out my um, maximum velocity. And it is important that you realise you do not need to know this derivation. But what you need an appreciation of is that this only kind of works if this angle is small. If this angle is not small, we can't do this formula. And that's the, kind of, that's the thing that will be assessed. What I'm going to do now is show you an example of how to use this formula with some information. So let's say I have a pendulum that is one metre long and at the bottom I have a mass uh, of, let's say, 10 kilograms going down. Okay. The amplitude of this oscillation here, let's say that is... 0.5 meters. So I'm going to have a meter long string and I'm going to stick it 0.5 meters out. I'm going to find the time period. I would like to find the angular velocity. I would like to find the velocity max towards the equilibrium point and the acceleration max towards this equilibrium point. Okay. And also, I would like to find x when t equals 2 seconds. Okay? So the first thing I'm going to do is to find the time period. I'm going to use my time period formula. So t equals 2 pi root L over G. So there we go. 2 pi, the square root of 1 over 9.81. And if I put that into a calculator, I have 1 divided by 9.81, square root that, and then times by 2, times by pi, and I have, oh, irony, 2 seconds. So I have 2 seconds is my time period. I'm finding that, I'm just going to change this one here, and I'm going to change it to 2.5 seconds, okay? So my time period for one oscillation is two seconds. My angular velocity, 2 pi over t, is going to be 2 pi divided by that, which is just going to be 3.13 meters um, rads per second. Okay. My Vmax is going to be omega times a, so that's 3.13 times by 0.5, which equals 1.57 meters per second. So that's going to be my maximum velocity, and that maximum velocity is going to be at the bottom of here. Okay. And then I'm going to find my acceleration maximum, which is going to be omega squared a 
So that's going to be 3.13 squared times by 0 0.5. 3.13, oops, 3.13 squared times by 0 0.5, which is going to be 4.9 meters per second squared. So what I've got here is I've got a formula using, um, I've used the information I've got here, I found the, the, uh, ten, uh, the time period, I found the angular velocity, and the angular velocity is all about the this oscillation. I found the maximum velocity it would be, and I found the maximum acceleration it would be. So this is the pendulum formula here, this one here. It's actually really important because it means that for a pendulum, as long as the angle is less than about 20 degrees, I don't care about the mass at all. The time period, I could put, if I wanted to, a massive bowling ball on here and it would not affect at all my oscillation. Okay, and that is an important part of this. This means, of course, if I was to go and oscillate something in space, I wouldn't be able to calculate its mass or I wouldn't be able to use the time period to work out its mass. However, we can use the oscillation, okay, time for oscillation to work out the length of an object, okay, as long as we know um, what g is there. So that is about SHM in a pendulum.